What's going on, e-learning human geographers? My favorite human geographers, if anybody's keeping track at home. We're on to our week three assignments, and that means our week three PowerPoint lectures. I guess I should call them Google Slides lectures. You're going to have two of them this week. The first is going to be on the concept of regions. Now, regions was actually part of last week's reading. However, uh, you need uh, to definitely get a little extra support on it as well. And that support is going to come in the form of uh, a quick little uh, slides lecture on it. So I want you to start by thinking about a map of the United States. And if I asked you, when we look at this map of the United States, hey, in your mind, draw a circle around what you consider to be the West in the United States, what would that be? You know, would it be the West Coast? Would it be the three Pacific states that border the West Coast? Let's assume Alaska and Hawaii are on there as well. Does that get included in your map? Maybe your West is larger than that. Maybe it includes the Mountain West. Maybe it includes Nevada or Arizona. Maybe all the way over to Texas, right? Uh, the whole point of this is you're going to have different definitions or different interpretations of what that means. And that kind of is an excellent way for us to start to think about the concept of regions in human geography. So here we go, regions, what are they? Well, we start with our formal definition first. A region's an area. It has one or more traits, characteristics, or some sort of common feature that makes it different from the surrounding areas. So we already know what a place is, right? That's a point on the map. Um, and what we could do is we could look at a series of places and we could see if they have anything in common. And if they do, we could almost draw a circle around those places. And in doing so, we'd be creating a region with some sort of common feature, characteristic, or activity that's going on there. So that's uh, the definition. Now, hey, they can be defined by any number of different characteristics. We could look at the physical location and say, oh, okay, hey, which of, these, uh, which of these locations is temperate or tropical? Which of these is in a valley or in plains? Uh, and we could draw a circle around those areas in order to create those physical regions. Or we could look at human characteristics. We could ask ourselves, hey, uh, where are a majority of the Spanish speakers in the United States? And we could draw circle around the areas, or I should say the places where that is, right? And we could create a region of Spanish speakers in the United States. We could do that with religion or ethnicity, right? We could do that uh, with almost any sort of human characteristic or feature in order to create regions. So again, regions are really just a series of places that have something in common with one another. Now, there are three types of regions that you need to know in human geography. I'm going to hit you with a lot of definition here, right? A lot of text on this, uh, on this slide right here. Okay, we start with formal region. Uh, that's usually the easiest to understand. Now, every one of these regions has a secondary name. So a formal region is also called a uniform region. Two things for the exact same, two names for the exact same thing. A formal region is characterized by some sort of common human property. And that can be, again, as I mentioned earlier, language, religion, nationality, maybe political identity, maybe culture. So the people in that area share some sort of human property. Now again, it doesn't mean everybody does. It usually just means the majority of people in that area do. So again, we could look at, hey, where are Spanish speakers or French speakers in the United States? Where are folks who speak those as a first language? Uh, where are they concentrated? Where are they located? Okay, by finding those places and drawing a circle around them, right, we have identified our Spanish or our French speaking areas of the United States. We could do it with religion, where are Catholics or where are Mormons located, right? And obviously we could find where Mormons tend to be clustered, where they make up a majority of the population. Uh, and we could uh, draw lines, for instance, around Utah, which is heavily Mormon, along with some of the surrounding states as well. Uh, you could do that with any sort of human characteristic out there. Where are baseball fans located around the country versus football fans versus soccer fans, right? Um, and uh, you could also do that with, with physical property. So you could say, hey, which regions of the country or of the world have a particular climate type? Uh, where do we see certain landforms, like, oh, I don't know, mountains or swamps? And then we could find those regions around the world. Now, where do, you know, what, what regions are growing certain crops, right? Where's corn grown in the United States? Draw a circle around it. That's what we call a corn belt. You can do the same thing with wheat. You can do the same thing with soybean, with cotton, with dairy, right? And each of those would tell us a little bit different uh, about the place 
uh, and the people that are there. Now, formal regions, first off, political entities. Any political arrangement or political entity, like a state, like a country, like a county, like a city, all of those are formal regions. And the reason is because they're defined by a common political identity. What we mean there is laws apply um, to those locations, right? So a country has its own laws, right? And everybody within those has a system of government and laws in place that we all follow. That's the common characteristic. So we are all part of the United States, which is a formal region. So is California. Keep in mind, California is a state uh, that has different laws, right, than the federal government does. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they're different. So because California has its own state laws, right, and it's got its own clearly marked boundaries indicating when you're coming and leaving, um, then that's a formal region as well. So is Orange County for that matter, right? So is every city in Orange County because, well, each city has its own different local municipal laws and statutes in place. So again, any political entity, any political arrangement that has its own system of government is a formal region because of the common rules, laws, uh, and governmental systems in place in each of those regions. So you're a part of your city, formal region, politically, your county, your state, your country, right? So all of those are in place. Climate regions are another good example, right? Because what's the formal characteristic there? Well, there's a common climate. That could mean common temperature, right? Common precipitation levels. Um, and uh, we can identify where those are located and uh, we can kind of try to explain why they are where they are. Landform. So I've mentioned this already, right? Are you in a flat land? Are you uh, in a hilly or mountainous area? Uh, we can identify where those regions are and again try to draw conclusions about those places. What do they have similar to one another? What do they have different? Economic regions as well. Uh, where is our industrial areas around the country, right? Where do we grow particular crops? Uh, where are oil regions around the world? Uh, and around the United States. Well, those are all formal regions because there's a common economic activity that's going on there, um, and whether it's oil or whether it's mining, right, or whether it is agriculture, all of that. And, and when we learn these things, we learn a lot about the people, right, and the physical landscape uh, that allows these activities to take place. Now, formal regions something in common, shared by a large number of people. It could be all or it could be just a large number. Uh, it could be, you know, hey, a formal region by population. Where are, is our population clustered? Uh, income, your ethnicity, right? Your ethnic background. Where do we see most Polish Americans in the United States, for instance, like Mr. Majewski and why? Crop production, right? Um, industry, uh, or any sort of physical characteristic, climate, temperature, rainfall, growing seasons, all of these uh, we can create formal regions with. So again, I already mentioned any political entity is a formal region, so Germany is, for that matter, so it's Berlin and every other one of these cities that's listed here. Um, shoot, even all of Europe, you could say, is a formal region politically because they belong, most of them belong to the European Union. Uh, here is a formal region that shows where corn is grown in the United States. First off, shout out to the chloropleth map we're looking at right here. Um, and this area here, the dark, dark green, that is where you see corn grown in the United States. Uh, more than 50% or the most of the, of the production of corn. So we call that the corn belt. Now there's actually a, uh, a wheat belt as well that we, can, that we could find if we were looking for that. There's a dairy belt. There's a cotton belt down here. Um, so again, uh, because the common characteristic here is the corn production uh, and makes up a majority of the crops that are being grown, that is our corn growing region, formal region of the country. I love to use the United Kingdom, right, because not only is the entire country of the United Kingdom a formal region, but so are all of the individual regions within it. They are broken up politically um, into separate entities. And as a result, each of them has their own systems for voting and government and rules, laws and regulations. And therefore, each of them is its own separate, independent, uh, formal region as well. Swag. Formal regions uh, can have swag. Well, in this case, at least they do. Uh, the Southwestern Division of the Association of American Geographers, yep. 
That acronym SWAG is a formal region, right? Because everybody that's a member here is a geographer, an American geographer, and they happen to be located in these particular states. One thing with formal regions I want to reiterate. You clearly know when you are entering one or when you are leaving one. When we enter, when we leave Anaheim and we enter O Fullerton or Placentia, we have signs that indicate, hey, you're leaving or you're going into this new place. If you are leaving the corn belt, you're going to know because you're going to look around and you're not going to see the corn anymore, right? You're going to start to see wheat being grown instead, for instance. So formal regions tend to have very clearly marked boundaries where you know when you're coming in from one, uh, when you're leaving one or going into another. All right, there's the Piedmont region of Pennsylvania. That is a generally low-lying area right outside of uh, the city of Philadelphia. And we have a lot of Amish folks who are clustered in that area. It's really suitable for agriculture, and so that's one of the reasons why. Um, I could show you any number of formal regions. I'm not going to because there's a number of activities you're going to be doing related to this. Instead, I want to move on to the second category of region, and this is a functional region. A functional region is also known as a nodal region. Not noodle, nodal. Uh, and a nodal region is a region that isn't based on some common feature that everybody shares or that the landscape shares. It's based upon an activity that's going on. Some sort of activity is happening within that region uh, that is drawing people towards it, right? And uh, the less attached to that activity you are, the less likely you are to use it. The further away from it you are, the less likely you are to use it. Um, and so we sometimes refer to them, like I said, as a nodal region. So there's a node, a center of activity. Think of like a, an egg that's been, that's been cracked open and you're cooking and it's got the yolk in the middle. The yolk's kind of like a node when we're talking about a functional region. So the rest of that region is linked to that node by maybe transportation systems, roads, railroads, maybe communication systems, right? Like telephone wires, for instance, uh, maybe electricity or other infrastructure in place, internet cable, or some sort of economic association. Uh, what we mean there is uh, a lot of folks are coming in to potentially use at activities in the node to take advantage of them, whether it's shopping, whether it's education, jobs are located in this node. It's almost like a beehive of activity. And then the closer you are to the beehive, you're going to see a lot, a lot of bees around there doing their thing, doing different jobs, doing different activity. Eventually you get further away from the beehive, right? You see fewer and fewer bees until eventually you get to a point where there just are no more bees. It's too far away from the node for bees to be located doing anything productive any longer. So again, uh, functional regions are about the activity, not so much about the common characteristic. Look, when you go into a shopping area in a downtown location, it's not like you have any, you know, it's not, you don't, you're not the, speaking the same language as everybody. You don't look the same. You don't have the same ethnicity, right? Uh, the common feature here is that you're all here to engage in a function and an activity. In this case, shopping. Um, so the best example of functional regions are downtown areas, sometimes called metropolitan areas, like downtown New York City uh, is a functional region. Uh, you have commuters that are commuting in, you have trade that's flowing into it, right? You have television and radio broadcasts, you have newspapers, travel for recreation and entertainment. All of these are activities that are taking place, and the closer you are to the node, the more likely you are to use them. Uh, the further you are away, the less likely you are to use it. You're going to use a different node, right? A different functional region, most likely, that's closer to you uh, or more advantageous. So again, functional regions, think about a center of activity, and then the further you are away from it, the less connected you are. The one thing with functional regions, they kind of have unclear borders or boundaries. You don't always necessarily know where it begins and where it ends, where the outskirts of it are, I should say. Um, and so they're not as clearly defined or marked or labeled as a formal region oftentimes is. So hey, we oftentimes think of functional regions as a like downtown center area, but even like individual establishments have a functional region or are a functional region. There's an area in your community that has a lot of fast food restaurants, right? Uh, that's a functional region for fast food. A mall is a functional region. People are not living there permanently. They're coming into that area, a supermarket as well, 
really any store, any shop, any uh, fast food restaurant, um, people are coming in to use the activity, right, to take advantage of it, whether it's to eat, right, whether it's to shop, uh, whether it's to go to school, like a university or a high school. Um, they don't live there. You're not, you have no other necessarily common characteristic or feature with everybody else that's there other than that you're engaged in the activity. Um, and if you are too far away from that mall or that supermarket, you're not going to go to it, right? You're outside of its functional region. You're going to go to a functional region that's closer to you. Uh, banks are the same way, a branch of a bank, a port, a seaport or an airport, right? Think about it. You have planes coming in, you have planes going out. Are people living there permanently? No. Does an airport have everybody that really is the same in any way in terms of their characteristics? No. It's the activity that's bringing them to and bringing them from. Functional regions almost always have people that cluster into it, right, usually in the mornings and oftentimes spread out away from it uh, either in the evening or at night. That's not always the case, but, um, you know, some functional regions might have more people come at nighttime, right? If, for instance, oh, I don't know, it's a baseball stadium, right, or a sporting event where the games are usually on later on at night. Now, the node is the center. The hinterlands indicate the outer areas, the boundaries of that functional region. So again, functional regions are defined by activities, connections, or interactions, whereas a formal region is, is defined by a common characteristic that people share in that area. Um, so for functional, newspaper, or any delivery, right? Think about this. Um, if you're within the delivery area, you're within the functional region of that newspaper or of that delivery service, that pizza place. Uh, but if you're too far away from it, it doesn't make sense for the, that newspaper or that pizza place to deliver their, their product to you because it's not worth it to them, right? So you're going to be outside of the functional region and probably in a different newspaper or pizza place's functional region. Think about commuters. Think about Orange County in the morning, right? You ever been stuck in that traffic coming into Orange County in the morning? It's brutal. That's because we're a functional region that's attracting people from all of the surrounding counties because of the jobs that we offer. Uh, think about the evening, right, or the afternoon when you're leaving. You get all that traffic going out, right, because that functional region um, is, uh, is, is generally used during the day. That's when most people work, after all. Um, and so folks are going back out to where they live. They're spreading out from that functional region. Subway systems as well, really any transportation system, trains, right, anything um, along those lines is a functional region. People aren't living on the subway, right? They're using it to commute, to move from one place to another. Highway systems are a great example as well. Um, they transport us from one place to another, right? They oftentimes merge or connect in or just outside of major cities, um, kind of like a cobweb design. Businesses of any type. When they are deciding where they want to establish their locations, they look at the functional regions uh, for the stores they already have, and then they decide, hey, are people having to travel too far to get to the, our location? Or are people not using our locations because they're so far away, they're, they're outside of all of the other functional regions? In that case, they might want to build a new business in that spot to serve the folks that are outside of the other functional regions. A school. A downtown, I've already mentioned a downtown, but a school is a functional region. People aren't living at school, although you might feel like it sometimes. Um, no, they're coming in to take advantage of a function, of a service. That's education, right? And then obviously when the school bell rings at the end of the day, uh, they are leaving. Um, I already mentioned a subway, right? It's an ultimate functional region. People are coming in to use it, to take advantage of it, to get around from one place to another, right? It doesn't, have you ever been on a subway or a train before? You know there's a lot of diversity there. Uh, so there's not really common characteristics. It's the activity that's bringing us together. Delivery area, I give you a small newspaper. It shows the, the functional region of their delivery. At a certain point, they're just not going to deliver. Uh, they're too far away, it doesn't make sense for them, uh, it doesn't cost, uh, you know, it's too high of a cost, or the information is not going to get to them in time, uh, so it's kind of perishable. Um, you know, hey, pizza places or any delivery place is the same way. If you've ever called the store for asked for delivery and they're like, oh no, you're outside of our area, you need to call this other location instead, uh, what's just happened there is, is functional regions are in place. I oftentimes like to consider, look at functional regions like this. Hey, think of like a tower, a cell phone tower, or a television tower, right? And uh, think about if you're close to that, right, that radio tower, for instance, as you're listening to the radio, you're going to pick it up really clearly. Your 
uh, gonna gonna be using it a lot more right because uh, it's gonna be relevant to you it's gonna be clear to you but if you drove away from where you were away from the tower eventually you're gonna start to get static right you're gonna finally get to a point where you can't pick up that radio station any longer that's because you've exited that functional region the closer you are to the center to the node um, the better connection you have to it until further away you get none this is actually a map of NBC stations in Iowa. So every one of these colored circles indicates a different functional region for a different NBC affiliate in that state. You'll notice some are larger than others. That's because some have bigger you know, towers and can, can, can go further distances um, and reach more people. Uh, but if you're located in one of these areas where you're outside of all the functional regions, you're not picking up NBC with your cable. Uh, so you're going to have to... Uh, you know, watch other news services or uh, you're just going to have to go without that information that you otherwise would get. So you're not watching, oh, I don't know, The Voice or whatever shows are on that NBC station. Let's move to the third type. This is a perceptual region. Perceptual is sometimes called vernacular regions. Um, they're regions that exist in people's minds. Ooh, I know that sounds super heavy, right? Uh, but really all that means is that we all construct regions in our minds, in our brains a lot of the time. Uh, it's based on our feeling. It's based on our attitude. It's, bared, it's based on subjective images or stereotypes or things we've read or things we've heard. Um, and uh, they tend to almost reflect people's mental maps. Um, now, what's interesting about it is each person's perceptual region is going to oftentimes be different. I could use the same term and say, hey, um, what is the South in the United States or what is Southern California? And I'm going to get, and I give everybody a map of California, and I say, hey, draw Southern California or trace around the outer edges of it. I'm going to get 30 or 40 different circles, right? Um, and none of them are necessarily right or wrong because perceptual regions, like I said, are in our minds and in our brains, and we think they're accurate, even though they may not be. But I could take every single person's response and I could see if there's any overlapping areas that we all agree on. And then at the very least, I can say, well, even though we have different definitions and boundaries for our region, we can all agree at the very least that this section is definitely Southern California because all 40 of us said it was. Um, so again, uh, perceptual regions aren't always necessarily right or accurate. Um, they may sometimes be inappropriate or incorrect, but... Um, they are really helpful to geographers who want to be able to uh, learn about regions that may not be obvious on a map, but using the people who live in an area, we're able to detect or identify ones we otherwise might not find. So Southern California is a perceptual region. Different means different things to different people. There's no clearly marked boundaries, right? It's going to vary from person to person. The South is another good example. Any really general location, upper Midwest, downtown. Right? Because what does that mean? Downtown means different things to different people. Even like neighbors in the same neighborhood. If I said draw a circle around your neighborhood, uh, we're going to maybe get two wildly different looking maps, right? Different circles, um, because it's going to mean different things to different people. A lot of the times like ethnic neighborhoods, for instance, like, oh, Chinatown uh, might have different definitions for different people. So they are a perceptual region. You don't exactly know where it begins and ends, for instance. Uh, you're still trying to figure that out and determine it uh, from person to person to person. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of various regions, right? I love this activity. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say these particular locations? I love this particular activity because I can give you stereotypes. And hey, we'll do this with my girlfriend since she's in the room right now. So um, you play along at home as well. What's the very first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the term Southern California? Babe? Plastic. Plastic. I think she's trying to say plastic surgery, people. She's trying to say we're all fake. Doesn't she sound like a Northern California native with that comment? All right, what about the South, babe? I'll tell you what I Barbecue. think. Barbecue. Barbecue, she thinks. Thinking with her stomach. That's why I love her. Uh, I would say racists, all right? That's personally me, okay, but or lack of education. But see, these are just stereotypes or perceptions or attitudes that are going to vary from each person. I bet when I give you those terms, you might think of something different. Babe, Iraq. Oh, God, terrorists. Terrorists, horrible. Oil, I think of. I think of desert as well. 
Uh, but do you see how sometimes like perception stereotypes, attitudes are going to affect individual responses here? Um, so it's really going to uh, uh, be an interesting endeavor for us to work on. New York City, babe, New York City. Oh, financial. Fin finance. finance. She's talking about Wall Street, right? That's yes. what she's thinking about. Uh, she's thinking about money right now, so we're not totally sure why she's with me. Um, I tend to think of the Big Apple. That's just kind of a term that pops into my head when I think of New York City. I think a lot of people and skyscrapers as well. Utah? Baby Utah. Mormons. Mormons. We both think Mormons first and foremost in Utah. <laughs> Secondarily, I think of national parks. They have some of the best oh, yeah. national parks in the world. Again, I hope you're doing this at home while we're playing, uh, and you can see it's going to be different answers for each people. If you really want to try this out, try this with your family members and throw out some of these terms and see what they say and compare whether they would be the same as yours. What about your neighborhood? If you think of your neighborhood, what do you think of? I think of good food because I happen to live in an area in Placentia that's got a lot of great Mexican restaurants. I also think of Valencia High School because where I live, it borders right up against that school. Chinatown. What are you thinking of with Chinatown? Uh, I'm thinking of food, right? Uh, good Chinese food. Um, I'm also thinking of like entertainment because I know that's a big draw for tourists and folks that really just want to have a good time as well. The whole point is, if we ask people around the country these things, we're going to get vastly, wildly different answers from place to place to place. By the way, in case you were wondering, back on Southern California, my very first thought when I think of Southern California is beaches. So maybe you do as well. Maybe you think of something like plastic. <laughs> All right. Anyways, we doing what we just did with the South. Uh, geographers actually asked people this: uh, What do you think of when you think of the South? What part of the South is? Uh, what part of the United States do you consider to be in the South? And depending on who they asked, you got wildly different answers. Some people said, "Hey, the states that tried to secede during the Civil War." Uh, Southerners identified all of these as belonging to the South. Okay. Northerners did not consider these two states to be in the South. They considered it to be part of the North. So again, depending on who you ask and the circumstances, you get wildly different answers. I love this example. This is a really famous study that was done by a dude named Wilbur Zelinsky. What a name, right? That's a name only a guy like Mr. Majewski could love. He took a look at phone books, yellow pages. Um, and he looked at the common names for businesses around the country. And what he did was he drew perceptual regions based on business names. Because if a small business gives itself a name based on a, re based on a location, you can assume they feel like they're a part of that area, right? Like that's where they live. Um, and so we actually created perceptual regions based on the map. And there is the map right there. So, for instance, in this area here in California, the most common business name for small businesses was Pacific, right? So, like, Pacific, oh, I don't know, uh, Pacific Electric, right? Pacific Pavers. Um, and so what he did was he said, well, this area, perceptually, the people here believe that they're part of the Pacific part of the United States. In this area, it was West, right? If you look down here, it's South. Down this area, it's the Gulf, right? So, Gulf was the most common name. The whole point here is, if we look at a physical map of the United States, we're not going to see these regions pop up. These are regions that exist in the minds of Americans about where they live. And a geographer can actually really learn a lot about uh, regions that exist in a place based on what people think. Their stereotypes, their perceptions, even if they're not always 100% accurate. I love this map as well. Um, another famous geographer uh, you know, asked people, hey, who, which areas of the country do you feel the most connected with? Where does your family live? Where do you travel to most of the time? Um, and uh, where, where is, who do you contact the most? Who do you do business with the most? Um, and what he found was the answers didn't really reflect state boundaries at all. In fact, Southern Californians said, hey, we feel a lot more connected based on all those to 
Las Vegas than we do to Northern California like San Francisco. And so he redrew the map of the United States and he said these are what the 38 perceptual states should be. If we redrew the map based on people's perceptions, the map would be more accurate if we drew it with these black lines instead of our traditional state boundaries. And then he went ahead and gave them his own names as well. So for instance, we would live in the new state of San Gabriel, which would include Southern Nevada, Las Vegas, and Western Arizona as well. Um, it's a really fascinating way of looking at things in a different sort of way than we do with formal boundaries. Um, this was a funny one that was making fun of Ronald Reagan back in the day, uh, in the 1980s. This is a while ago, so I don't expect many of you to uh, get a lot of the jokes here. Uh, but it's kind of stereotypical based on some of the comments and some of the decisions that President Reagan made during his time. Uh, it's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be tongue-in-cheek. All right? That's why, by the way, California is huge because he was the governor of California and thought that to be a very important state. Texas, I love this map. It's like a, a stereotypical Texans map of the United States. Of course, if you know, um, the stereotype about Texans is they feel like their state is like the most important thing in the world. It might as well be a little mini country. Uh, they like to say everything's bigger in Texas, and this map kind of reflects that. Uh, I want to point out to you, look at California. They call it uninhabitable. That's because Texas and California kind of have a rivalry, um, and a lot of Texans think because of our political climate and things like that that maybe uh, they could never live there. Now, again, is this accurate? Of course not. Uh, is it based on perception stereotype? You better believe it is. All right, well, if Texas is going to have a chance, we're going to have one too, right? This is a stereotypical joke about how Californians see America. Um, and, of course, makes me laugh, right? California, we're awesome. In the Northwest, most Californians just sort like coffee because they know that's where their Starbucks comes from. I love this map, or this part here, where this entire region of the country is just Vegas, question mark, right? We know it's around here somewhere, and that's usually the only reason we head into most of these states, right, is to try to go to Vegas to have a good time. Uh, Texas, of course, fake cowboys and pickup trucks. Uh, religious nutballs uh, in the southeast, of course, because it's a very evangelical place, right? And California, not so much. Uh, so there's clash. Florida, old people, because a lot of folks retire there. So do you see how, like, it's stereotypical? Maybe a little element of truth to some of this, uh, but a lot of it, it might just be inaccurate or flat out wrong. Um, you'll laugh at this one as well. This was uh, a survey that was done online. Uh, and what they did was they asked Americans to, to indicate what their biggest stereotypes were about the other states around them. Um, and then they kind of took the answers and they made them a little funnier. So California, fake boobs and oranges, right? What they're trying to say there is Californians are associated with plastic surgery and growing fruit. Uh, up in the Northwest, in Washington, geeks, right? Because, of course, we have Microsoft and other really important tech companies there. Um, and so the rest of the country kind of stereotypes it that way. Nebraska, corn. Wisconsin, cheese. Maine, lobsters, right? South Carolina, racists. North Carolina, cancer factory because tobacco um, companies tend to be located there, all right? Um, <laughs> Mississippi and Alabama, diabetes and lard reservoir, those are known as some of the least healthy states, right? And so as a result, people are kind of stereotyping them. Idaho, potatoes, you see how it works. Uh, this is a map, finally, of the United States of baseball, right? And what a geographer did here is he asked people who their favorite baseball team was. Um, and in any area that had more than 50% fans of that team, he drew a line around it. He created these perceptual regions. So these are the regions that show allegiances for baseball teams. So down here, San Diego, here is Anaheim. This part of California, Nevada, Arizona is Dodger country. Look at the Giants all the way up the coastline, almost all the way to Washington, right? My team, the Cubs, we get Chicago, northern Chicago, then we get all of Iowa, much of Nebraska, all the way down into Kentucky, Indiana, and even parts of Ohio. So again, are these corresponding to any actual physical boundaries? Are they corresponding to political boundaries or formal regions? Not at all. Instead, we can learn a lot about people based on simple things like what sports they like or what teams they root for. Uh, or what television shows they tend to watch, right? All of these things matter. 
when we're trying to identify regions around the country or around the world. Great little summary here, formal, functional, perceptual. Love these three, they, this slide, because it gives you a really, really quick, brief description and contrasts the three types. You need to know them. You need to identify them. Uh, you're going to do an, a practice activity uh, where you're going to submit it back to me as an assignment through the Google Doc. You're also going to have a quiz on this as well. Make sure you got it nailed to the wall before you take that quiz. If you have any questions, you know where to contact me. Uh, Mr. M signing out here. Lecture one of this week, Regions, getting ready for our next, our next lecture to come.